So if you've been watching people like Grant Cardone or Ben Mala, you're probably interested in multifamily real estate. And by multifamily, I don't mean me and my son drawing in the room at the same time. I, I love drawing. I, Jack loves drawing. I mean buying multifamily apartment buildings where you control, let's say, 10 different units within one building and 10 different families are renting each of those units and you are milking the cash flow to get rich and retire early. Well, today I'm going to break down step by step exactly how to buy multifamily real estate, how to find multifamily real estate, and how to get the money to actually make these deals happen. So without further ado, let's get right into it. So the best way to start when it comes to understanding multifamily real estate is by getting a little bit of the lingo and understanding how the numbers work when it comes to multifamily. Multifamily is almost exclusively numbers based. So here's the scoop. When Ben Mala tells you, hey, you know what? You should look for a seven cap. No, not a four year old. You should look for a seven cap. What does that mean? Well, seven cap basically means you're bringing 7% of the actual value of the building to the bottom line. So here's an example. Let's say you can buy a 10 unit apartment building for $1 million. This means you're spending $100,000 for every single apartment within this 10 unit apartment building. 10 times $100,000 is a $1 million apartment building. Let's now say the market rent for each of these units is $900. If we multiply that out by 12, we'll get an annual figure of $108,000 of gross rental income. But the building's going to have expenses, pressure washing, cleaning, maybe it has a pool, what about painting? And so there's an acronym we could use to understand the typical expenses that that go into multifamily real estate. I like to call it TIMR, and that stands for Taxes, Insurance, Maintenance, Management, Utilities, and Reserves. Those are your core expenses when it comes to multifamily real estate. We can typically estimate these expenses using an expense ratio of between 30 to 45%. Most commonly, banks will use 35% as an expense ratio. So that's what we'll go with in this example. So simply put, if we have $108,000 of annual income that's being generated by these 10 apartment units that are each renting for $900, and you take off 35% for expenses, you're left with a net or a bottom line income of about $70,200. That is your net operating income, also known as your NOI. Now, since we paid a million dollars for this deal, we can do a quick calculation and figure out what the cap rate is on this example I just came up with. So since we have $70,200 at the bottom line, we can take that, divide it by the purchase price, and we get our cap rate. The cap rate in this case is 7.02%. So this way, if you went to any real estate investor and said, I'm buying a million dollar building with a cap rate of 7.02%, they can say, oh sweet, you're bringing $70,200 of income to the bottom line like that. Which by the way, if you are going to be in Vegas later this month, consider stopping by my one day in-person real estate investing crash course. Don't worry, there is nothing for sale at that day. It's just me literally for a day telling you as much as possible about real estate, single family, multifamily, everything. Doesn't matter how much experience you have, you're pretty much guaranteed to learn something. Hope to see you there. Oh, and if you want to come with somebody, make sure to shoot me an email at kevin at meetkevin.com and I'll get you a discount for coming with more than one person. So Ben Mala's seven caps are cool, but does that mean we only make 7%? I mean, don't we want to do better than 7%? And the answer to that is, yeah, oftentimes we do. And with real estate, we can. See, there's another thing called the cash on cash return. And we're gonna calculate that using leverage. See, if we bought this $1 million deal with a million dollars of cash, our cash on cash return would just equal our cap rate. Both of these figures would be 7.02%. There's no magic behind the difference between these two figures. However, the big and most common thing that can change this formula is leverage. 
Leverage is essentially debt. So let's say we approach a bank and say, hey, we've got a really good deal on a million dollar apartment building. Would you be willing to finance 65% of this property? Most banks, as long as there's sufficient cash flow, are more than happy to finance multifamily real estate. And things can get complicated there in terms of how much they'll finance. But simply put, in expensive areas like San Francisco or other parts of California, banks might only let you finance 50% and sometimes they'll even finance less than 50%, which means you're putting more money down than you're able to borrow. However, in areas with higher cash flow, like in the Midwest, you might be able to finance with just 25% down on commercial real estate. Now, for the sake of this example, let's go with 35%. That is, we're gonna put 35% on this $1 million deal. So, million dollar purchase price, $350,000 is going to be our down payment. And don't worry, I'll talk about strategies for coming up with that $350,000. Then this means the bank is giving us a loan for $650,000 to help us buy this property. Now in today's market, you could generally get financing for four and a half percent. And that's pretty conservative because you might be able to get financing as cheaply as 4%. But let's go with four and a half percent. So there are two types of loans that we can get. The first is called an interest only loan. This is the easiest one to calculate and this is like the investor's favorite loan to get because it minimizes your payment, which makes your paper return look bigger. I'll show you. If you don't follow yet, no worries. We're going to walk through it. So recall that we're making $108,000 gross on this building. After expenses, we end up with $70,200. But now we have an interest only loan of $650,000. So because this is interest only, doing the math on this is super easy. We don't even need a mortgage calculator. All we have to do is take $650,000, multiply it by the interest rate, and boom, there we have our annual interest expense. In this case, that means we're spending $29,250 in interest. So remember, we had $108,000 of gross income, after expenses, we had $70,200 left over, but now we have to spend $29,250 on interest. This is now going to leave us with about $41,000 after paying our debt. Note, I rounded by about $50 just to make the number a little bit more even. So now with a net of $41,000, we actually have a different return because we have financing. Things just got complicated, right? Well, let's make it super simple. Remember when we did the net operating income, we were trying to figure out how much money we were making on a million dollars spent. We were making 7.02% on a million dollars. That was our cash on cash return, it matched our cap rate. But now we have financing involved and we only took $350,000 out of our pocket to control a million dollar deal. So now what we're actually gonna do is we're gonna take our new net of $41,000 and we're going to divide that by the money we actually spent to control this deal. So $41,000 as a cash on cash return on $350,000 is 11.7% as a cash on cash return. Much better than the return if we've paid all cash for the deal. And this is very common. Once you introduce leverage into real estate, your returns tend to go up. And watch what happens later when I throw in the mix refinancing. Right, Jack? <laughs> You're so cute. You're so cool. Thanks for being here with me. You're such a nice boy. Now option two is the more common scenario, and this is called amortizing your mortgage or your loan for the property. So remember you got a $650,000 loan at four and a half percent, but this time we're going to pay back principal and interest. This makes the math a little bit trickier, but we could just use a mortgage calculator to make it simple for us. So in this case, if we amortize a loan over a 30 year period of $650,000 at four and a half percent, your loan will cost you about $3,293 per month. Now annually, that's gonna cost about $39,500. So if we go back to taking our net of $70,200 minus 39.5 for our loan, we're going to end up with a net net on this deal of $30,700. So in this case, the net is actually smaller than that interest only loan we had, mostly because Jack's holding up a microphone now. <laughs> 
No, it's because you're actually also paying down principal. You're paying off the loan, which the more you pay off the loan, the more safety you have in a deal. So usually interest only, while it gives you more return on your cash, or it appears that way, you're not paying off as much of the deal as you could be paying off, which means you could have more risk if the market shifts. Principal paydown is a nice way to insulate yourself from market risks. Although you don't only want to rely on principal pay down either. So now let's figure the cash on cash return for this amortized loan. Well, if you're left with $30,700 and you divide that by the $350,000 you put down, you get an 8.7% return. So you notice that the highest return is the interest only loan, then the amortized loan, and then paying cash, cash matching our NOI's cap rate of 7.02%. So this is how you can see that debt can actually boost your returns in real estate. But financing isn't the only way to make money in real estate. In fact, now let's talk about the ways to add value to multifamily real estate so that you can make more money on your deals. You want more money? What are you gonna do when you with your money? You're gonna buy a hundred dollar gun. You're gonna buy a hundred dollar gun? Yeah. What, what does that gun shoot? The new Nerf bullet. The new Nerf bullet. So we talked about net operating income. We talked about cash on cash returns. Now let's talk about increasing the rent as a way to increase the value of your property. Let's say on this fictitious deal that we came up with, we're able to raise the rents $30 per unit. $30 per unit is an extra $300 of cash flow per month for the entire building. This is the nice thing about multifamily is you raise the rents across the board. That's a big boost in cash flow. So a $30 rent increase is actually $3,600 of extra cash flow per year. Now in my real estate investing course linked below and in our private live streams, which are included in that real estate investing course, I teach you how to find and buy below market value multifamily real estate, as well as single family real estate. And one of the concepts is buying multifamily real estate with low rents. So let's stick with our million dollar building and say that we go into these $900 units and for whatever reason, those units were being sold below market value. Maybe the owner hasn't raised the rents in a while. And now you go to the property and say, hey, I'm the new owner. Everybody's getting a hundred dollar rent increase. Now this comes with some pros and cons and some risks. You know, what if all your tenants move? But in this fictitious example, let's say they all stay and they all agree to pay a thousand dollars per month now. Now all of a sudden you've increased the income of this building in one swoop from $900 per month per unit to $1,000 per month per unit. An extra $100 per month per unit is an extra $1,000 per month of income or an extra $12,000 of annual income. By the way, it's very common for landlords who unfortunately don't always know what they're doing not to raise the rent. Not raising the rent is a big mistake in any form of real estate investing. But anyway, simply by raising the rent, you can dramatically increase your cash flow as a multifamily real estate investor. But there's something else that raising the rent unlocks for you almost immediately. And that is the next way to make money on multifamily real estate. Introducing the refinance. So the easiest way to talk about this and show you how the value of your multifamily real estate can go up when you increase the rent is by talking about a concept known as the gross rent multiplier. Here's how that works. If you buy this million dollar deal and it has a gross rental income of $108,000, you could divide a million dollars by $108,000 of gross rent, and what you get is a gross rent multiplier. In this case, that multiplier is 9.26. That is how many times gross, gross rent, you are paying for the building. In other words, you are paying 9.26 times the gross rent for the value of the property that you're buying. You can approximately fact check this by taking $108,000 and multiplying it by 9.26. Now here's the cool thing. If you did type that math out, now try doing, instead of $108,000 by 9.26, put in $120,000 of annual gross income times 9.26. And remember, we paid a million dollars for this deal. 
But now, if we keep that gross rent multiplier stable, let's say that's the gross rent multiplier for the market we're investing in, which becomes very important for how to value multifamily, and that goes into a detailed subject. Again, things we cover in the course linked below, but hey, you know what? Maybe we could share another video in the future if y'all like this kind of content on YouTube. I don't know if this is too luxury to be on YouTube, so let me know what you think if I end up deciding to post this video. Sometimes I worry that these more classroom style videos come across as too, uh, preachy, but anyway. Okay, so we bought the building for a million dollars with a 9.26 times gross rent multiplier, but now we have more cash flow. So our gross rent multiplier actually tells us that the building is now worth $1.11 million, which guess what we can now do? We can now walk on over to the bank and as long as the appraiser agrees that our gross rent multiplier is the same, this is approximately, I'm simplifying here, obviously. We could probably get that same 35% down loan, maybe even better. But let's stick to comparing this as evenly as possible and go with a new 35% down loan. Well, 35% down, this time, instead of getting a $650,000 loan, means we can get a loan for up to $721,500. And all I did was take that 1.11 times 0.65, or that max loan amount to represent 35% down. But the cool thing is we already own the property. So we have equity in the property. We don't have to come up with that 35% down again. All we're gonna do is pay off our old loan and we're gonna have some extra money. In fact, let's assume we're gonna pay some small loan fees and we're gonna get this new loan of $721,000 minus some loan fees. Let's say we basically clear about $715,000. We're gonna pay off our $650,000 loan, and now we're gonna have an extra $65,000 of money that the bank just wrote us a check for because we just did a cash out refinance. That $65,000, by the way, is not taxed because just because you borrow against the property doesn't mean you have to pay taxes on it. Loans are not taxable events, according to the IRS. Obviously, always consult a CPA and a loan officer and the proper professional. This is obviously just a video on YouTube for entertainment purposes only, and please don't sue me, bro. So we started this journey with $350,000 down, but we just did a cash out refinance and got $65,000 out of the deal because we raised the rents. This means we only have $285,000 in the deal, which means our return on investment probably just went up. Let's do the math. I'm gonna speed this one up a little bit, all right? You could do this math by following the same steps we talked about earlier. Speed this one up. So let's take our $120,000 of gross rental income, take off 35%, and we're left with $78,000 to go spend on stuff or be a return on our investment, which is probably the better decision. But anyway, $78,000 of income, now we gotta pay our debt, if we get an interest only loan, we are going to have payments in the neighborhood of $32,500. So $78,000 minus $32,500 leaves $45,500, which if we now divide $45,500 to figure out what our cash on cash return is, do not divide it by $350,000. We don't have $350,000 in the deal anymore. We only have $285,000 in the deal because we did a cash out refinance, which means we have less money in the deal and we're making more money. So now if we divide $45,500 in net income after our interest only loan payments, we see that our cash on cash return is 15.67%. That's crazy. That's really, really amazing. So all of a sudden this seven cap that we went in and raised the rents on, then did a cash out refinance on and increased our leverage position with an interest only loan, boom, 15.67% ROI, baby. <laughs> but now let's go with the more conservative measure and assume that we amortize the loan, which is generally more common. That's oftentimes what you're going to see. So if you amortize this loan, you're going to have expenses of $44,000 for the debt. So $78,000 minus $44,000 leaves you with $34,000 of net income. $34,000 of net income divided by $285,000 that you have left in the deal works out to a return on your investment of 11.2%. Also substantially better than the numbers earlier. Remember, more cash flow, more debt, more return on your investment. <laughs>
So what's the next way to make more money on multifamily real estate? Well, the value add. So you could buy a deal with below market value rents. You could refinance it because you bumped the rents or whatever, or you could change something about the deal that's going to make the property better and appeal to tenants more. Maybe you're going to reduce turnover, which increases your net. Maybe you're going to make an improvement like adding a swimming pool or creating a security gate and uh, you know automatic gate as an entrance to this property. And all of a sudden you're going to increase the people's comfort. You're going to minimize the people loitering around on the property and people might be willing to pay you more money in rent for this investment. This can unlock a few opportunities for you. So let's say you install this fence and gate and all of a sudden you could raise the rent $50 per unit and it cost you $50,000 to do it. $50 per unit times 10 units is $6,000 of annual income. So you're now making $6,000 more of money and you spent $50,000 in improvements to make this deal happen. Not only is $6,000 on a $50,000 improvement a really good return on your investment alone, I mean, there's a payback period because you have to pay for the improvement, right? But guess what also just happened? Your ability to sell the property for more or go back to the bank and refinance again to pull some more money out. In other words, that $65,000 you pulled out earlier, you could have used that to add value and then go refinance again and take the money out again. Now you can go overboard with leverage and a lot of people did go overboard with leverage and that's why a lot of people lost their pants in 2007, 2008, 2009 and you had a lot of foreclosures going on. It wasn't just single family, it was also overvalued multifamily. So you have to be very, very careful that you're not overpaying for real estate. Preventing you from overpaying for real estate is probably one of the biggest parts of my investing program linked below and those live streams I do. There are a lot of people's deals that I look at where I go, whoa, are you sure about this one? And I go, no, 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 no. But then there's an equal amount of people where I go, yes, buy this, yes, yes. They're following the principles, they are winning and people go close on deals that make them money. Now, where does the 1031 tax deferred exchange come into play? Well, if you don't want to refinance your deal, you can sell the deal. Problem is when you go to sell, you have to pay taxes on your gains. So here's a quick way that works. Let's say you buy a building for a million dollars, you sell it for $2 million, and you've put $100,000 of improvements in, and you had $100,000 of other expenses and realtor fees and all this. So in other words, you basically made $1.8 million on a deal you bought for a million. Now, subject to some adjustments like depreciation recapture and all this crap, you basically add about an $800,000 profit on the deal. $800,000 of profit taxed at a long-term capital gains rate, depending on which state you're in, uh, it's gonna be at least 20%, is like $160,000 in taxes. That sucks. Nobody wants to give the IRS $160,000 on a multifamily deal. Especially since even if you paid the taxes, what would you probably do after you sold the deal? Well, you'd probably just go reinvest it into real estate because that's what everybody says to do. Is if you make money, go reinvest it. So what's a cool thing that you get to do with real estate? Well, in real estate, you get to take advantage of something called the 1031 Tax Deferred Exchange. And this basically says, hey, IRS, uh, we know we owe you $160,000, but would you mind if we just caught up with you later? We're gonna be reinvesting all of our profits into real estate again and providing housing for people. So you guys cool if we just catch you later? Now the answer to that is simple. It's yes, as long as you don't touch the money. And this is where you need something called an exchange accommodator, who's basically going to hold your profits until you go find another deal to go place that money into. That way you've never actually touched the money. As soon as you touch the money, you get taxed. So don't touch the money. What I wanna teach you right now are some basic ways to find deals and get the money for deals. First things first, how do you hunt for deals? Well, when it comes to multifamily real estate, I hate to say it, but deals can be far and few between. That is, there aren't that many deals on the open market right now. So here are the common ways to find deals. Number one, you go on a website called loopnet.com and you type in multifamily real estate in whatever area you're searching for real estate in. 
That's a great way to get sort of introduced to the multifamily real estate market and kind of see who the power players are in your neighborhood in terms of commercial real estate brokers. The second option is the multiple listing service. This usually syndicates with like Zillow and Redfin. So if you click multifamily real estate, it shows up there. But most big deals don't show up in the MLS in the commercial real estate space. Usually you have to leverage broker connections to get into these larger multifamily deals. In fact, a lot of multifamily real estate is sold before it ever hits the market. This is why I teach in my programs linked below that you have to leverage the connections that you build with your circles. And I teach you exactly how to build those connections and circles as well. You do have other options. And these are options like what the wholesalers do where you can mail owners or basically farm for owners. This is a strategy, but usually relatively low odds. So so the best deals you're going to get are going to be off market deals. The next best deals are the ones you can get your hands on that are actually on the market as long as you're not overpaying. Now, beyond actually finding the deals, you have to prove that you have the ability to actually buy the deal, which means you should be armed with proof of funds and a pre-approval letter, which is why the first thing you should almost always do when it comes to shopping for real estate is call a lender and get a pre-approval letter. It doesn't cost you anything to pick up the phone and ask, hey, what are the requirements for me to get pre-approved for a commercial loan or a residential loan or any kind of loan? Just tell them what you want, just be upfront. Hey, you know, I wanna get into multifamily real estate. What do I need to get a loan? Boom. The lenders work on commission. They're more than happy to help you for free. Now, earlier I said, I'd help you figure out where to get the cash. Well, here you go. There are a few different ways you can get the cash to invest in real estate. The number one option is you borrow it. Now you have two ways to borrow money in real estate. Let's say you wanna buy that million dollar deal and you need $350,000 to buy it. If you don't have that $350,000 saved up, you've got two options when it comes to borrowing it. One, private money or hard money. This is where you usually pay like eight to 14% for that, that extra benefit of getting private party financing. That gets expensive, that gets risky. This is, that's where you start touching the, the risk of foreclosure. That's more scary. The other option is leveraging other real estate that you already own. So let's say you have a large portfolio of wedge deals that you bought, single family, smaller deals, larger multifamily deals, other deals, whatever. You could leverage equity in those deals by basically by taking out secondary forms of financing against those, now get cheaper loans to buy bigger deals. If you're not interested in borrowing more money, which I don't blame you if you're not interested in that, the other option is partnering with people or doing real estate syndication, which is basically kind of like crowdfunding money from a bunch of people on the internet or whatever, and then going to invest it in real estate on their behalf which by the way, if you're interested in investing money into real estate, especially like multifamily deals, take a look at the link below. I'm not sure I'm gonna do anything with this yet. This is definitely not a solicitation. It should not be construed as any kind of general offer solicitation, but I do want to start building an interest list in the event that you're interested in investing in a small scale real estate investment fund that I would be managing and spearheading. $5 million, I believe, is the legal limit for starting out. And again, right now, it's just an idea. I'm collecting information. I've been working with attorneys already. So uh, take a look at that link below. No harm in dropping your email in there and uh, filling out the quick, uh, you know, few question questionnaire and uh, you're in, you'll be informed if, uh, you know, I decide to do anything and I might not. It's all going to be dependent on me actually finding good deals. And in fact, the last thing I just said is the key. There's usually no shortage of people with money willing to partner on your deals, whether you're using an LLC or you're syndicating or you're partnering in one form or another, there's almost never a shortage of people willing to invest. There's almost always a shortage of good deals to invest in. So even if you don't have money, you could learn the concepts of investing in real estate, learn the concepts of hunting for deals. And when you find deals, guess what? The money shows up. Most people get that backwards. They start looking for investors, but they don't have deals. Wrong, <laughs> bad wrong, like it's worthless. So now what is the most realistic way to invest in multifamily real estate? Well, it depends on the area that you're in. If you're in an area with high cash flows where you can buy deals that are seven caps, nine caps, 10 caps, great. 
you could probably get started buying five, 10, 20 unit apartment buildings pretty easily because you could get more financing on them because there's more cash flow. If you're in an area with lower cap rates, like you do the cap rates on multifamily and they're like 3%, 4, 5%, starting with multifamily is going to be a little bit tougher. And because multifamily is so competitive right now, most people are going to be better off starting by finding single family wedge deals. Now, since this is a multifamily video, I know that a lot of people are gonna hear that and they're gonna cringe or start pulling their hair out or maybe you've clicked out of the video by now. Oh well, sucks for you. But I just wanna be real here. There's like no competition in the single family space. So if you wanna build your net worth fast, it's not a bad idea to start small and work your way up. Nobody starts with a 100 unit apartment building unless they already had a ton of dough in the coffers. If you don't yet have money, if you don't yet have a net worth, if you don't have experience yet and you haven't built a portfolio yet, maybe consider starting with some really sweet wedge deals. Get yourself 10 of these golden tickets, build a net worth, become a millionaire, and then take your assets and start scaling into some big deals. And that's when things start getting real fun but you gotta put in your dues. And you know what? There's nothing wrong with putting in your dues on easy deals like single family wedges. So there you have it, folks. Thanks so much for watching and until next time.